Hi, this is Orion, and you're listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories Podcast. Well, I have a number of short stories and fairy tales here. For the next little while, I'll be sharing a large chapter book with you. Illusion by Paula Volsky. For 200 years, the exalted classes have ruled over Vonar by virtue of their dazzling magical abilities. Now, their powers grown slack from disuse, they concentrate on the pleasures their station affords them, ignoring the misery of the lower classes. It is only when the red tide of revolution sweeps aside all distinctions of rank, home, and family that the exalted realize the gravity of their mistake. Thrust into the very center of the conflict is the beautiful Elise Faux de Raval, spirited daughter of a provincial landowner. Now, like those she disdained, she must scramble for bread in the teeming streets of the capital city, the key to her abilities an elusive secret, and find a way to survive in a world gone mad with liberty. Orion's Bedtime Stories is proudly sponsored by Anchor FM. If you've not heard about Anchor, Let me tell you that it's free. They've got creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. They'll distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple, and many more. You can make money from your podcast. You've got no minimum listenership required. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Illusion by Paula Volsky. Chapter 9. The long, unquiet summer ended at last. Shireen's smothering thick coverlet of hot air finally turned itself back. The nights cooled and lengthened, while the afternoons gradually progressed from suffocating to bearable to pleasant, and eventually to glorious. The most beautiful season of the year had come, and the breeze blowing in through the open window at the Ruvignac Lando was crisp and alive with the promise of change. No change needed or wanted, Elise told herself. Things are quite delightful, just as they are. The Lando passed under the old marble arch and into the bottom of the Avenue Parabo, and there on the right, the only commercial establishment permitted to function along the entire length of that exclusive thoroughfare, Crayonette Chocolatier, and vended miraculous confections beyond the artistic range of even the best exalted kitchens. Master Crayonette's sculptures in dark and white chocolate, his molded chocolate creams and truffles, his fantasies in spun sugar, sometimes embellished with fresh flowers, hand-cut faceted sugar jewels, or real gold leaf, often graced royal tables both at home and abroad. Now it seemed they would do so no longer. Crionette's establishment was closed and deserted. Every window was broken, the door hung ajar on twisted hinges, and the sign had vanished. The cream-colored storefront was blackened by fire, In the middle of a relatively undamaged section, someone had chalked a great scarlet diamond, adopted emblem of the People's Reparation Party. They had chosen the color red to express their anger, and the diamond shape shape carried a double meaning. Diamond is precious stone to symbolize the financial indemnification owed the injured commons of Bonar and diamond as the hardest substance known to represent the durability of the reparationists' resolve. Elise's lip curled disdainfully at the sight. Master Crianet was an artist, a genius in his own way, a civic treasure, and instead of the respect and acclaim he deserved, he had endured violence at the hands of vicious imbeciles evidently determined to destroy all that was exquisite in the world. Barbarians, she observed aloud. They're devils, miss, Kirithan nodded. 
wicked devils, those rip, repairmen, what do you call them? Those rep people. I cannot understand why the gendarmerie does not put a stop to this foolishness. Really, they are remiss to allow it in this neighborhood. Do they mistake the Parabo for Rat Town? It is quite outrageous, and someone ought to complain. Could be the gendarmes are afraid, miss. I mean, after all that great hurly-burly in the 8th District three months back and all, well, that simply won't do. They're not supposed to be afraid. They're paid to protect decent citizens from criminals. If they cannot perform that function, then the city should hire others who can. Maybe that's true, miss, but all I can say is I wouldn't want to meet up with those reps on a dark night. The truth now, wouldn't you be afraid? No, Elise tossed her head. Perfect contempt leaves no room for cowardice. I cannot fear ruffians, so crude, oafish, and stupid, and neither should you. Bereft of reply, Kirtha shook her head. The Landau continued up the street, eventually reaching Zaralenvo Ruvignac's residence. Elise, closely followed by her maid, alighted from the carriage. Before she reached the door, a familiar tall and silver figure emerged, descended the spotless sandstone steps, and met her halfway down the walk. The cavalier of Vaux Murel bent over her hand. Elise curtsied in reply. It was the first time they had come face to face since the night of her presentation, but his was not a presence to be forgotten. Exalted miss, summer's candlelight scarce did you justice. The daylight of autumn speaks far more truly, and thus I see an early promise fulfilled beyond the scope of dreams. Accept my admiration. Excellency, Elise curtsied again, smiling composedly, secure in the knowledge of her perfectly groomed prettiness, enjoying the flattery, the magnificent weather, Vaumurel's practiced gallantry and courtliness. This, she felt, without quite putting the thought into words, was the way things were supposed to be. Brilliant response eluded her, but if he desired to continue the discourse with a young and sought-after maid of honor, the burden of invention fell upon his shoulders. Exalted miss, favor me one moment. He neatly blocked her path, allowing little choice. I must entreat your indulgence. Indulgence, cavalier? Honor and deference I might grant, but my indulgence surely oversteps the bounds of presumption. Ah, you are a quick young study, perhaps almost as quick as Madame Zerelen herself. But let us not fence. The urgency of the matter admits of no such luxury. Exalted Miss Vauderaval, I ask your assistance. You must help me persuade your grandmother to depart Shireen as quickly as possible. Could he possibly be joking, she wondered. He didn't look it. Those youthfully vivid eyes in the slightly age-scarred face were unsmiling, even grim. She suspected he was about to say something she didn't care to hear. I see the questions in your eyes. Let me answer all at once by telling you that it becomes increasingly dangerous for her, and for you, and all your kinsmen, to remain. The city is overrun with murderous fanatics. The secret societies, subversive self-styled parties, anarchists, and various leagues of bloody-minded malcontents breed and proliferate like rats in a sewer. Factious, mutually suspicious, rife with dissension and rivalry though they are, yet their hatred of crown and exalted unites them. They are violent, resolute, and effective. Following years of devoted effort, they have at last succeeded in stimulating the rage of the populace to such levels that cataclysm is now imminent. The only safety lies in flight, and you must convince your grandmother of this. He paused, and Elise stared at him. 
Never before had her deepest hidden fears found so clear a voice, and now her impulse was to deny, to resist. She shook her head vehemently. Cavalier, your concern does you much credit, but I am certain you exaggerate. If matters were as desperate as you suggest, then surely we should see a mass exalted exodus. But we do not. Life goes on as always, and that is as it should be. How absurd and fearful we should appear. How we should compromise our dignity to flee in the face of a few peasant complaints. She smiled as if amused. Better to die than appear undignified. A truly exalted sentiment. Die? The smile faded from her face. Behind her, Kirtha uttered a small mouse-like squeak. You, like the majority of our peers, greatly undervalue the extent and significance of those few peasant complaints, as you term them. It is this ignorance that presumably accounts for exalted complacency in the face of mounting danger. I wonder if you have any knowledge of recent events in Shireen. Did you know, for example, that the prisons are filled to bursting with traitors and conspirators? There are new arrests every day. Did you know that the reparationists have grown so numerous and arrogant that they no longer trouble to conceal their activities, but meet freely in public to foment rebellion? No one dares to interfere with them. Did you know that Chauvinurian's proscribed works are hawked and purchased openly in the streets, and his dangerous eloquence wins him converts even among the educated classes? Did you know that there are now many areas of the city into which it is unsafe for members of the exalted to venture by night or day? And in the light of all these warning signs, is it possible for you or for your grandmother to continue in willful blindness? I have heard rumors, but never heeded them, Elise returned unwillingly. She did not at all wish to continue a conversation so disagreeable, but he was still blocking her path. Such matters are the concern of the gendarmerie, are they not? It is the grossest folly to support that a few squads of indifferently trained and equipped city police will shelter us against the coming storm. The soldiers, then, the army, and the royal guards cannot stand against an entire population. Moreover, their sympathies are sure to be divided. Entire population? Come, this is madness. Most of the people are law-abiding and loyal to the king. Child, only look about you. The citizens are ready to drink blood. There is our exalted magic to shield us, and it's always done. Ah, the celebrated magic. Not a plentiful commodity, I fear. The grooves about his mouth deepened. Tell me, exalted miss, do you possess any? Well, no, not personally, but what of that? My uncle is most accomplished, and there must be many others like him, so I don't really believe there's anything to be afraid of. In fact, I think those riots and street rallies will all end in a little while when the weather turns cold. The snows and bitter winds are sure to chase those noisy troublemakers straight indoors, where they'll soon forget all about their stupid grievances. After all, in nature's sovereignty shall man discover true harmony, she quoted. Yes, I have read Rhys Ross Zumo's fantasies. His sentiments are charming and naive as a certain young maid of honor I could name. Listen, child. There is trouble brewing, and all of us Shireenian exalted stand to suffer. I have sought to alert those concerned to little effect. The exalted capacity for self-deception is apparently boundless, and I am universally disbelieved. For myself, I care nothing, but your grandmother is a different matter. In her grace and perfection, she is the very epitome of all that savages seek to destroy. I've tried to warn her, but she is too proud for self-preservation. That being so, I seek intelligence in the keener instincts of the young. 
While there is still time, you must take Zerulan away from this place. Do you understand? Cavalier, the improbable exchange astonished her. What can you expect me to do? Talk to her. Only that. She is excessively proud of you, very fond, and apt to be swayed by your pleas. Oh, I think not. Madame is never swayed by anyone's pleas. She is hard, but not so hard as she contrives to appear. If you've any regard for your grandmother, you must somehow persuade her to depart Shireen. She might withdraw to one of her country estates and there be safe. Or the two of you together could return to Derival. Leave Shireen for Derival? For detestable, exclaimed Elise with a delicate shudder. She had lately begun to affect the Shireenian courtier's exaggerated contempt for all things provincial. There are other possibilities, Vaux Murel suggested patiently. Should you not like to tour the foreign capitals, Tsar, Fluglin, Lanthi Ume, and all the great cities? Oh, indeed, some day. Then Madame must take you there, and at once. She will prove the perfect guide and chaperone. Perhaps that is best, Vaux Murel added, almost as if to himself, to leave Vonar altogether. It is not too cautious. Plead with her, then, exalted miss. Ask it as a personal favor. Appeal to her generosity, and you are apt to prevail. Oh, that seems guileful, even a bit shabby. Not when it is done for her protection. I implore you, exert all your influence to serve both your grandmother and yourself. Will you attempt it? He was staring down at her with such intensity that she could not meet his eyes. Really, it was too fantastic, almost unbelievable. I could ask her, I suppose, she returned, uncomfortable and willing to say anything that might bring this interview to a swift conclusion. Exalted miss, may you succeed where I have failed. He bowed deeply and left her. Elise stood frowning after him. She was startled, confused, profoundly uneasy, and a little resentful that he had blighted her day. He is full of dark, idle fancies, no doubt, she remarked aloud without conviction. Well, it curdled me clear through to hear this talk, miss, said Kirithi. Old people, Elise muttered between her teeth. Old people. They entered the house, and a servant conducted them to Zerolin's upstairs sitting room. As Elise walked into the chamber, a small white fur explosion greeted her. Prince Faux Plume, a long term Mouvignac house guest, had not forgotten his rightful mistress. Now he flung himself upon her, yapping, dancing, bounding waist high, circling underfoot everywhere at once. Elise was obliged to stroke and tickle the frantic little creature into panting quiescence, finally passing him over to Kirtha before crossing to the table by the window where her grandmother sat at tea with Aurelie, the older woman regal in damps and velvet, the young girl buried in ruffles, ribbons, and a thousand tight ringlets. The appropriate curtsies, compliments, and ceremonious kisses were exchanged. Elise seated herself. I shall pour for my cousin, Aurelie announced. I am resolved to polish my department to the last degree of perfection, and I believe my progress toward that end is already remarkable. She handed Elise a full cup. There, was it not prettily done? Guess what, cousin? Only guess who was just here to see Gronti. She did not pause for reply. It was the Cavalier Valmuriel who calls upon us nearly every day. La, I suspect he is in love with Bronte. I do believe it truly. Such eyes he turns upon her. It must be love indeed. Child Orly, you are deliberately impertinent, or else incorrigibly silly, observed Azerilen. The former is far preferable, but I fear the latter to be the truer description. La, madame. I believe you blush, but you know you really shouldn't. I only hope that I shall attract admirers when I am your age. And the cavalier is so distinguished. 
such a grand manner, such an air, and he is so tall, and his eyes are still so very pretty. What a gallant he must have been in his day. Was it not so? Child Aurelie, you babble like an idiot. Hold your tongue. Now, Grantie, I am certain you won't take offense when you know I speak solely for your good. Between the two of us, I think you might consider the cavalier as a possible match. Is he not to be made a marshal? Of course he is old, terribly old, but he still has all his teeth, and very pretty they are too. And I am convinced that it would take but very little tiny effort on your part to extract a proposal, or at the very least a declaration. Perhaps no more than a languishing glance accompanied by a deep sigh would serve. Or if it does not, you might lure him out into the garden by moonlight and there counterfeit a swoon. I am assured this is an infallible method. Don't you think she ought to, cousin Elise? Don't you think she... You foolish, prattling child. One more word of this and I shall send you from the room, Zerlin warned. But Granty, one more word. Arlie subsided with obvious effort. Elise tasted her tea then spoke up reluctantly. The topic had all but introduced itself, and she had given her word. I met the Cavalier Muriel as I was coming in, she confessed. We spoke, and he took the opportunity to express his fears concerning... You need not continue, Zerlin interrupted. I can guess what is to follow. I witnessed the encounter from my window just now, noting Vaux Muriel's insistence and your obvious uneasiness. He sought to enlist your aid in driving me from Shireen, did he not? Elise nodded uncomfortably. Well, you have brought the matter to my attention, as you no doubt promised, and that discharges your obligation to the Cavalier. Beyond that, I have heard all the arguments, all the dreary, doomful prophecies, and I do not care to listen to them again. Then you think there's nothing to fear, madame? It would be more fitting to say that I will not fear. I reside in Shireen because I prefer it, because it is my wish. Unthinkable, then, to alter my choice for the sake of a riotous canyale. I do not permit fear to govern my actions, for that is not the way a Vonarish exalted consents to live. It is not life, but existence only, a base existence that I despise. Zerlin looked rigid and unyielding as a marble effigy carved upon a tomb. Formidable, Granty, Arlie burst out. La, that is fine. I shall stay here with you, to be sure. Will you not do the same, Cousin Elise? We shall all stay together, living bravely and freely like true exalted. I confess, I had thought we must withdraw to the provinces, enduring rustication like the Count Vaux Givant and all his sorry tribe. But now I scorn to do it. Indeed, I do. Elise smiled slightly at her cousin's enthusiasm. She, too, thought Zerlin's sentiments fine, but recalling Vaux Muriel's conviction couldn't banish all doubt. The cavalier appeared most certain, madame, she persisted, and much concerned upon your account. Surely you won't disregard his warning altogether, but take precautions to guard yourself? Against abduction, yes, when Muriel comprehends that my resolution is proof against threats and blandishments alike, he may attempt more forceful persuasion. You cannot suggest that he would carry you off against your will. It is more than possible. It is exactly that sum forty years ago during the Hetzian civil wars, in the midst of which I elected to take the waters at Zoal. Perturbed by the advance of the rebel army upon the town, and incensed by my refusal to forego the benefits of daily immersion, Murel and a few of his servants staged a midnight raid upon my rented villa. Catching me quite unaware, he clapped me into a carriage and conveyed me over the border. Oh, but how delightfully enterprising of him, madame. Possibly. The charm of the gesture eluded me at the time. Ah, superb, I really exclaimed. Were you in bed, asleep and defenseless, attired in nothing but a flimsy transparent nightgown when he came for you? Tell us, Granty, do. I shall not worry you with trivial detail. 
And did the rebel army reach the hill? inquired Elise. Yes, but not for another full day after. So you see that Miral's fears on my behalf are altogether premature. However, it is not of my past that I desire to speak, granddaughter, but rather of your present and future. Mine, madame? Elise's attempted innocence was not convincing. From the moment she had received her grandmother's summons, she had suspected what the topic of conversation would be. It had been postponed for a while, but Zerilyn was not to be put off forever. I am informed that the Duke of Ferrant pays you assiduous court. Is this intelligence accurate? Well, it depends on what you mean by assiduous, I suppose. Do not hedge, girl. I hear his attentions are marked and unmistakable. He has requested an assignation? Is this a matter to discuss before... Elise's eyes cut significantly to Aurelie. Beyond doubt, if the child listens carefully, she may perhaps acquire useful knowledge. You will listen, child Aurelie? Oh, yes, indeed, madame. Aurelie's myriad ringlets jiggled avidly. Excellent. You may remain, but hold your peace. Zerilyn turned again to Elise. Well, granddaughter, the duke has requested an assignation. Elise sighed. Often, she admitted. He has sent you letters? Returned unread or else publicly shredded. Poems, flowers, fragrances, bonbons? All returned, except for the last, which my roommates devoured despite my protests. Songbirds? Live butterflies to finish a formal coiffure? Albino rodents? Trained monkey, and all such requisite livestock? Rejected. And what of the more substantial offerings? Jewelry? Objets d'art? Advancements of your family members? A position at court for your father, perhaps? Father can rot in Quebec and welcome. Quite so. But what truth in the rumor that his grace has offered to settle property upon you? I believe he sent around a deed or a certificate of title or some such document. I, I did not trouble to observe closely. Legalities bore me. Never underestimate the fascination of certain legalities, granddaughter. Such negligence reveals a want of imagination. And how long has Ferrante's pursuit continued? Several months now, has it not? Elise nodded. Your resistance has been well-engineered, consistent, provocative, perfectly designed to inflame his ardor. Upon that score, I applaud your skill. The game cannot, however, continue thus forever. All the court applauds the comedy, and his grace stands in danger of public ridicule, a thing he abominates above all others. In the face of repeated failure, the Duke's initial enthusiasm must eventually transmute to contempt and revulsion. As your sponsor and partisan, it is incumbent upon me to warn you at this time that you stand in danger of overplaying your hand. Why is it, Elise inquired after a moment's reflection, that everyone must insist that I am playing a game? Why is it that everyone is so certain that each refusal is meant as an encouragement, each rebuff calculated to allure, each word deceitful? In short, that I am a lying hypocrite. Bah, you speak like a schoolgirl. Nonetheless, I begin to perceive my error. Zerilyn surveyed her visitor minutely. Have you then conceived a particular detestation of the Duke? Detestation? Oh, no, not exactly. Yes and no. It's hard to put into words. Her grandmother offered no assistance, and at least continued in some confusion. That is to say, I don't like his grace. I find him brusque and abrupt, presumptuous, cynical, and arrogant. I am not at all easy in his company, and yet somehow his attentions don't displease me. It's not simply that his greatness flatters my vanity. It does not? 
Zerolin inquired with amusement. Certainly it does, but that is not the whole of it. His grace somehow conveys an impression of force, of command, assurance, vitality, and power that is attractive. He seems devoid of doubt or hesitation. When we are in the same room, I am acutely aware of his presence. There's something about him quite strikingly... Uh, Elise groped for the right word. Masculine? Zerolin suggested. That's it, exactly. It is a quality whose appeal is immediate and somehow... Uh, visceral? Uh, just so. Uh, so you see, I'm uncertain. I can't decide. But you cannot stand hesitating forever or you will lose your chance. You realize, granddaughter, that you are offered an extraordinary opportunity. But I wonder if you recognize the full extent of your good fortune. Do you realize how many women long for such eminence? How few attain it? The duke is second in Vonar only to the king. As a man, he is far from repugnant to you, that is clear. And caught up in the excitement of the chase, he offers all that you could possibly desire. He does not offer affection, Elise said slowly. He does not offer loyalty or respect, and nor does he offer marriage. Ah, Zerolin's brows rose. Now we come upon it, I think. I confess you disappoint me. I had not thought to discover you still such the provincial, and bourgeois provincial at that. Does commonplace marriage, with all its limitations, represent the height of your ambition? I don't know. You had best give the matter some thought, then, and quickly. If you would marry, whom do you choose? I am informed that your success at court is noteworthy, and your suitors numerous, which merely confirms my expectations. It seems a pity to waste such potential. It seems a pity to waste such potential, which perhaps approaches my own at a similar age. But let us review the possibilities. Are you tempted, for example, by the title and fortune of the Marquis Villard? He can keep them both, returned Elise. A decent, amiable sort, but indescribably boring. A fortnight of his conversation would sink me in enchanted sleep for a hundred years. A pity. What of Rouville Nezoirvo Lilvant, then? In love with his own profile. Vau Renache. Clever but heartless. Vau Plenier Vuyen. A boy, merely. Stasi Vau Crebe. Superficial. Vicky Viceroy. Vicky. Oh, he's a dear, Elise laughed. But who could take him seriously? It would seem that you are hard to please. Oh, I don't mean to be, madame. It's just that all these men all seem so incomplete somehow. It's as if they aren't altogether real. They're polished and elegant. They speak with cleverness and wonderful gallantry. But where's their... their... oh, I don't know. Their true intelligence, their imagination, their humor, their heart. Why, all of them put together don't have as much of those things as... Dref Zinnerson's lean, dark face flashed into her mind for an instant. Well, as one of the serfs back home in Derivelle, each seems lacking. I don't know. Perhaps I'm silly, or maybe I expect far too much. But how am I to decide what to do when nothing at all seems right? Zerolin took her time to answer. You are very young, granddaughter, she observed at last. Your doubts and confusions are those of the very young, and your habits of mind reveal inexperience. I speak in particular of your tendency to view each decision as final, irrevocable, and therefore overwhelmingly significant. It would appear, for example, that you regard the proposed Ferrante liaison as a permanent step, one that might bar you from a future match more to your taste. In short, a move that limits or destroys your options. 
In reality, of course, the opposite is true. Such an association would greatly expand your opportunities. The woman occupying His Grace's attention is a notable personage in her own right. Her prestige is immense, and the measure of that prestige devolves upon her subsequent consorts. Thus, she is a prize much sought after. Her choices are varied, her freedom of action all but limitless, her position altogether enviable. It is something you would do well to consider. Then you're advising me to accept Ferrante, madame. I am advising you, above all, to please yourself. How this may be best accomplished, only you can judge. It is entirely plain to me what course best serves my cousin's interests, broke in Aurelie, unable to contain herself any longer. There can be no question. She must spurn Ferrante. Awed by this display of antique pride and virtue, the king himself will lose his heart, and then he will be and then he will be her slave, her absolute drooling, mewling, groveling slave, eager to give anything for her favor. La! My cousin is like to gain a duchy if she but spurns his grace. That is what I will certainly do when my own turn comes. Not a bad stratagem, child Aurelie, Zara Lynn permitted herself an acid smile. Better yet, if his majesty had never even been known to display the slightest interest in any female other than his own wife. In view of their majesty's childless state, his interest even in the queen would appear open to question. Well, Aurelie appeared unconvinced. Perhaps the beauty destined to capture the king has not yet appeared at court. When I come to court, we shall see indeed. You shall not come to court within the decade if you do not learn how to govern your tongue. But grant he. To Elise's relief, the conversation drifted on to other topics, and the matter of Ferrante's attentions was allowed to drop. Presently, tea was finished, and she took her leave. The grey Rouvignac Landau was waiting to return her to the Bivier. She settled back upon the cushioned seat with a small, rueful sigh. Throughout the short journey, she remained silent, lost in frowning abstraction, and Caritha did not venture to address her. Her silence continued as she entered the palace to make her way along the now familiar glittering corridors to the maid's quarters, where yet another offering awaited her. The quarters were deserted. The maid's blanched denizens attended the queen. The other girls were off about their own errands. Even the Marquise Vaucouves was absent. Elise walked into the maid's mauve chamber. There on her pillow reposed a small parcel wrapped in wine velvet bound in black satin ribbon, identifying emblems of Ferrante's tribute. Elise heaved another sigh. The Duke's determination pressed upon her with an almost tangible weight that irritated and gratified at once. For a moment, she considered tossing the package out the open window into the garden a couple of stories below, but curiosity and something more got the better of her. Stripping away the velvet, she opened the box to discover a silver filigree locket upon a fine silver chain. Quaint, pretty, and probably quite old. Beneath the locket lay a card bearing the simple request or a command. Think of me. Ferrante. Elise smiled, surprised and intrigued. The ornament was charming beyond doubt, but of much inferior value to the Duke's previous offerings. It would seem that a message of some sort was intended, but the meaning was open to interpretation ranging from graceful compliment to the very opposite. The deliberate obscurity piqued her curiosity. Still smiling, she drew the locket from its container. The moment she touched it, a distinctive fragrance rose to her nostrils, a heavy, intense perfume, musky almost to the verge of vulgarity, compelling and subtly disturbing. For a moment, her vision swam and she swayed, lightheaded and heated as if she'd drunk too much champagne. Her eyes cleared and the world righted itself. 
but the fragrance lingered, tenacious and assertive as the Duke himself. At least pried open the filigree cover and the source of the odor became apparent. The locket contained perfume in solid form, a waxy substance, snake mottled and lion tawny in color. She ran her finger across the smooth surface and the scent clung to her flesh. Absently, she touched her hair, her temples, her wrist, her earlobes, and the fragrance enveloped her. She stood still, drinking it. Then, slowly lifting the locket to her throat, she heard herself murmur, Put this on me, Kareth. What, miss? You mean he's finally sent something you'll keep? That's a new one. Kirtha was behind her, clever fingers fiddling with the delicate clasp. Phew! Kill me dead! What a smell! You find it disagreeable? No, miss, not disagreeable at all. It's fine and fancy, and no mistake. And the necklace is real pretty. Only that smell is... Well, it's... What? It's what? It's going to give people ideas, that's what. What ideas? What are you talking about? Just... Ideas. If those lords and cavaliers and such don't already have ideas, they're sure going to get them when they smell this. There's just something about it. Nonsense, child. You exaggerate. It's ordinary perfume, nothing more, and very much in the mode. Yes, miss. The clasp clicked shut. There. Got it that time. Finished. Turn around, miss, and let me see. Elise obligingly wheeled, and Kareth clapped her hands. Suits you, it really does, and it goes nice with your dress. Only, are, are you feeling all right, miss? You're looking kind of blank and slack-jawed, like someone just fetched you a good one behind the ear. Have you been at those pills again? No, I haven't, and there isn't a thing wrong with me. Even as she spoke, Elise didn't altogether believe it. Once, somewhere, somehow, she'd experienced exactly the same cloudy confusion. The recollection hovered teasingly just beyond the bounds of memory. Each time she made a mental grab, it dodged like a gnat. Presently, she shrugged and gave up. She'd remember eventually, but not now. In any event, there were more interesting things to consider. The Duke of Ferrante, for example... She suddenly discovered that his image filled her mind, an extraordinarily vivid and substantial image, one that she could almost touch, and one that would not go away. As the hours passed and she went about her customary business, drifting from palace to theater to Havilah Gardens, and then back to the Biviere and the Queen's service, then on to dancing and a late dinner, Moving always in the midst of the gallant, the gorgeous and giddy, the image of the Duke was never quite dislodged. Often it was very immediate, very real, and sometimes much less so, even fading to the verge of nothingness when her mind was active, but never wholly absent, and never distanced for long. Nor did she actively seek to prize him from her mind, for the constant vision was oddly gratifying, a secret satisfaction or would have been, had she not been troubled from time to time with that sense of doubt and vague confusion whose nagging familiarity she could not quite account for. As the hours passed, Elise began to find herself looking for him everywhere she went, at the playhouse, in the Queen's presence chamber, at the card tables. Always her eyes searched the crowds to no avail. The Duke was nowhere in evidence, and her discontent mounted. She had thought to conduct the survey discreetly, but her preoccupation did not escape her companion's notice. Stasi Vokrev remarked jokingly upon her distrait air. Volnu Villard appeared wounded by her inattentiveness, while Marinotte of Viste laughed and called her the Enchanted Princess. To all of them, Elise responded with smiling, uncomfortable denials, and her eyes continued to wander. The Duke remained invisible, 
When at last Elise repaired to the maid's quarters and slumber, her frustration had built to teeth-grinding levels. She fidgeted impatiently as Kareth undressed her and snapped as the maid attempted to unfasten the locket chain. Leave it alone! Kareth stared at her, startled, then shrugged philosophically and continued her work. Elise bit her lip, somewhat ashamed, but remorse quickly subsided, crowded from her mind by thoughts of the Duke's purposeful countenance. A little later, she lay in bed, eyes wide open in the dark. She was acutely conscious of the locket, whose silver weight, heated by her body, lay warm as a human hand upon her flesh. The unusual, persistent perfume was strong in her nostrils, and sleep was a long time in coming. In the morning, she awakened to find the Duke's image fixed, if possible, more firmly than ever in her mind. The day that followed echoed the preceding afternoon and evening. Elise pursued her accustomed activities, and always and everywhere her eyes roamed the corridors and galleries in search of his grace. Two or three times she caught sight of him, and each time she froze, paralyzed, torn between the urge to accost him and a curious impulse to flee. As for Ferrante, he seemed not to see her. If he noticed her at all, he showed no sign. He was unconscious or else indifferent, and Elise fingered the fragrant locket in mounting disquietude. So matters continued for the next several days. The flow of the Duke's gifts and messages had entirely ceased, a fact unkindly remarked upon by all the maids of honor. He neither sought his former quarry nor appeared aware of her presence. Elise, bewildered and obsessed, began to lose sleep. Her appetite failed along with her spirits. Pleading illness, she moped alone in the maid's mauve chamber, where she sat for many hours absolutely fingering the locket that hung day and night upon her breast. At the end of the week, Ferrante sent a message, a simple and forthright invitation to dinner for two hours in his rooms. In scanning the note, Elise was once again conscious of that elusively familiar sense of confusion, of wrongness. It was not enough, however, to delay by an instant the dispatch of her affirmative response. Thank you for listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories podcast. We hope you've enjoyed it and that you have a lovely, relaxing evening. Thank you and